I'm trying to figure out what precisely causes me to leave my superb plastic pack liner behind in favor of, very much in air quotes, waterproof compression sacks as I enter the 100-mile wilderness. Is it hubris? Is it inexperience? Or just plain distraction? I'm feeling strong and capable after climbing Mount Katahdin, coming down to my beautiful campsite on Katahdin Stream right before a thunderstorm hits, which was mostly just noisy and not wet. The gorgeous summer weather with perfect temperatures in the upper 70s holds me in its embrace, and I'm lulled into a belief that's hard to shake, that belief that this idyllic moment will continue. Oh boy, that is one of the hardest beliefs to shake as a hiker. I mean, we're outdoors and we're in nature. And nature could care less about how we want things to go. Yesterday's lesson on Katahdin was all about taking risks. And today's, it seems, is the lesson, everything changes. Welcome to Blissful Hiker Podcast. I'm Allison Young, the solo, female, middle-aged, titanium-reinforced, long-distance backpacker, Blissful Hiker. We're in Season 5 of the series of personal essays. I call them audio narratives. They couple storytelling, found sound, and my own flute playing. And in each episode, I explore a journey of self-discovery where I share the sometimes unglamorous but vital truth about empowerment as badass people who don't need permission to blaze our own trails in this journey we call life. If you enjoy these podcasts, you can support them through Patreon. There's a link in the show notes or at blissfulhikerpodcast.com. I think right now I ought to pause to tell you what's going on in my life outside of hiking. A week before I got to Katahdin, I had surgery to remove a suspicious tumor from my right breast. Now, the pathology report from a biopsy seemed to indicate carcinoma in situ, or a cancer that's in place. And that makes calling it a carcinoma a misnomer, since these cell mutations are not yet really cancer. They're in place. They haven't invaded the body. That's why some oncologists don't use the word cancer, which tends to freak people out. They just call this type of growth a precancer. But still, it had to come out, hence my surgery, the lumpectomy. But that next pathology report was not yet back before my scheduled departure from Maine. So you can imagine, I just didn't know what to do. Should I wait around to find out what it meant? Or do I just get going? As luck would have it, my amazing surgeon is also a hiker. She said to me, you know, we can't do anything right now. We don't know anything. We don't have any information. So just go, and I'll call you when we know more. Four days later, I was on a plane traveling to Maine and the start of the Appalachian Trail from Mount Katahdin, hoping against hope that her call would include the news that they got it all, and I was clear. I take my time breaking camp as the sun fills my sight in dappled light. Today, I'll leave Baxter State Park to enter the 100-mile wilderness, But it's not far. It's about 13 miles to the first shelter at Herd Brook, where I plan to sleep tonight. And the trail is flat and easy, filled with wildflowers and birdsong. An eastern wood peewee whistles at me. Yeah, I know, Mr. Peewee. I'm tough for an old gal. And I've got everything I need for the 100-mile wilderness in this small pack of mine. I have so got this. Lady slippers in pink, white, and yellow push up along the path on tough stalks. A man passes, telling me he's finishing just as I'm starting. And a young man that I met in camp named Adrian comes up from behind, flying past me. And I catch up to Ingrid, the solo German woman who I saw in Katahdin. She joins me for a bit of the hike, and we stop at the magnificent Big Niagara Falls. The air couldn't be sweeter. 
The official trail takes in these falls before joining the Penobscot River, where paddlers and huge rubber boats sing as they ply the current. It's hot, and I drink up, swatting mosquitoes who find an opening under my bug net. I meet a shortcut trail through recently burned woods with signs warning not to linger since trees could decide to flop over at any moment. It takes me to a bridge and out of the park, Katahdin, an enormous monstrosity, seemingly growing right out of the ground. And from here, I can see the fold in its tablecloth where I climbed the exposed rock. I also see the sky turning dark and clouds moving across her surface. Boy, am I glad I climbed yesterday. I cross the bridge to a road, and finally, a commercial campground. Nothing is open this early, though a few fishermen scoot by. The young man who calls himself Music Man catches up at A-Ball Bridge, and we take a selfie, still in sunglasses, just as a thunderbolt hits the mountain. It's beautiful, it's stunning, but of course, thunderbolts mean rain. Isn't that the way things go? I laugh and casually reach inside my backpack for my raincoat. I've done this a million times in New Zealand, in Scotland, in Patagonia. But somehow, this rain is different. This is main rain, heavy and already saturated air. We meet Adrian, and our suddenly soggy trio crosses the road in a downpour. The trail continues in a hole in the trees, dark and forbidding, like pushing through the wardrobe into Narnia. And that's where I see the sign welcoming us to the 100-mile wilderness. Okay, it's not welcoming. It's cautionary. Here's what it says. It is 100 miles south to the nearest town at Monson. There are no places to obtain supplies or get help until Monson. Do not attempt unless you have a minimum of 10 days supplies and are fully equipped. This is the longest wilderness section of the entire Appalachian Trail and its difficulty should not be underestimated. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) I laugh as I read it, the rain bouncing off my coat. And then suddenly I realize, they're not kidding. I'm headed into an area without any amenities. I mean, there are a few roads, but they're forest roads. You need a four-wheel drive to drive on them. Help could be far, far off. Just as this sinks in, another crash of thunder eggs on the rain, and we hightail it through the woods. (laughs) Talk about living in the present moment. It's a little over three miles, just an hour, Adrian yells out, and we gather even more speed as rain turns to marble-sized hail, pounding our outstretched hands on trekking poles. I'm in big trouble, and I know it. The rest of that wet, muddy, hailing race is a blur as we finally arrive at the beautifully built lean-to shelter already filled with wet and cold hikers. There are about 250 backcountry shelters all along the Appalachian Trail for us backpackers to use on a first-come, first-served basis. Typically, they're just an overhang roof, a wooden floor, and three walls. And they sit near a spring for water, and they have an outhouse. The shelters are here to lessen the impact of camping, and clearly to protect us from the elements. Though I should absolutely know better, it comes as a shock just how awful those elements can get. I jump inside to get out of the rain and meet a ridge runner, a sort of lean-to warden, who holds court with an older man. They immediately make fun of me and the scoop that's attached to my backpack. It's a milk jug with the top cut off, the handle easily attaching to the pack, and I carry it around with me to make collecting water easier. What's your problem, guys? Does it really bother you that much? I ask, shivering. As if to vindicate my choice, a hiker asks if he can borrow my scoop, since the stream nearby is less a stream and more pools of water we're collecting is quite difficult. It's all men in here, and it's crowded. 
so I ask them to avert their eyes while I peel off my sodden clothes to put on something dry. The scar on my right breast is still red, the stitches not yet dissolved. Why am I so wet? Raincoats are not truly waterproof, at least not the ones you'd wear while hiking. I mean, you could put on a heavy, fully waterproof coat worn by fishermen at sea, but it would weigh too much and you'd boil inside. So it's a trade-off of breathability, allowing the sweat to somehow evaporate, while you still stay dry and warm. Unfortunately, running through the hail, I sweated far too much. But my clothes are dry inside and they warm me right up, and I set about eating food to give the rain time to let up before I set my tent. I'm suddenly glad that I arranged a cache midway through this wilderness, so I'm only carrying five days of food, and I can pick up a resupply at one of the forest roads. The ridge runner and the older of the hikers yammer on, not making fun of me anymore, but turning to more personal subjects, starting sentences with phrases like, I'm not a racist, but... or, I love women, but... Oh my God, I gotta get out of here. Eventually, the sky clears just enough for me to set up a soaked-through tent, put on more nearly soaked-through clothes, and cuddle into a damp, lumpy sleeping quilt. Oh my God, I am so screwed. Two more men I met on Katahdin show up, unhurry and step, and place their tents near me. The tone changes immediately, and they ask me how I am. I hate to admit it, but I tell them I made a bad choice using waterproof stuff sacks instead of a large garbage bag. Both of them encourage me to borrow any of their clothes, and if things really go awry, to simply crawl into their tent if I'm shivering. To be fair, later the Ridge Runner offers to bring me a garbage bag to store my things. That's pretty nice. And it's still warm enough outside that my body heat dries the quilt. Not completely dry, but to one degree above clammy. It's funny. My surgeon told me to just go on this trip, to just start hiking, because we didn't have the pathology report. We didn't have enough information to do anything. I knew that I'd be heading into this wilderness, walking 10 days before I'd have a conversation with her. One of the things she emphasized was the best action for a positive prognosis for me would be to just get back on trail. Walking heels, for sure, but this blissful hiker lives to hike. Moving my body would empower me, and it would give me the courage I need to face whatever I would end up having to face. Still, as the rain starts up again and pounds on my tent, I wonder if this kind of survivalist hiking is really what I need. Hmm, that's a question for tomorrow. And to my surprise, wet, clammy, and a little bit overwhelmed, I sleep just fine. You can subscribe to Blissful Hiker wherever you get your podcasts. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review. That helps the show get discovered. Blissful Hiker is on Patreon. You can support the show financially as a patron. Help me get on trail to collect sound and to create these stories. Find a link to Patreon in the show notes or at blissfulhikerpodcast.com. That's also where you can find other episodes, the blog, see pictures, contact me, blissfulhikerpodcast.com. Next week, I move forward into the one dry day in the 100-mile wilderness. And that one dry day is delicious. Until then, my friends, kia kaha and happy trails.